Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Kerry Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Well, Rich, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. I've been looking forward to this, Carrie. Well, me too. And you have spent, let's start here. You spent quite a bit of time in the corporate world before you became the president of World Vision. Uh, you studied at Cornell. You went to the Wharton School of Business, very prestigious you know, place to get your MBA. You worked in marketing at Gillette. Then you moved to Parker Brothers. And then finally, you became the CEO, as you kind of joked, you know, of a fine luxury tableware company, uh, which is Lennox. Um, not that anybody would ever aspire to do that, but there, you know, you found yourself, you said, what did you learn from your time in the corporate world? What were some of the takeaways? Yeah, so I really look at my time in the corporate world as uh, another education, right, about yeah. how an organization is run. So you learn a lot of the basics about how organizations are run, basic financial dynamics, marketing, sales, human resources, IT, all of that stuff. You know, big corporations are to business and leadership uh, what Harvard and McGill are to education. You know, they're institutions mm -hmm. and, and and actually laboratories of higher learning. And, and so... Uh, you know, those are the things that, uh, you know, I learned uh, when I was at my time uh, in, in the corporate world. It was really an education. I, and I learned a lot about leadership because you, you learn about leadership by, by watching others. And uh, so I got to see a lot of other people as well. And uh, yeah. What was your childhood like? Did that prepare you for that? You, you, you kind of, you had a different childhood, didn't you? Yeah. You know, I... Uh, I'm kind of an unlikely candidate to have ended up at two Ivy League schools and uh, to have been CEO of a number of companies. My, you know, my my dad had uh, three marriages and three divorces. Uh, I was a product of the third marriage, and uh, he was an alcoholic. And my dad never finished uh, the eighth grade, so he was not an educated man. Had a lot of problems: alcoholism, bankruptcy. You know, the bank foreclosed on our home when I was ten, and uh, my parents divorced and. My mother was married twice and never finished high school. So kind of coming out of this uh, working class background uh, as a child, you know, I kind of, uh, I, I guess my reaction to it was, you know, I'm going to try to avoid the mistakes my parents made and and try to, you know, do something with my life. And I, and I saw education really as my way, my way out. And it turned out that that was the case, you know, Cornell and then uh, the Wharton School of Business, as you mentioned. So, yeah, so that was my, my childhood background. It's a really interesting profile, Rich, because there's, I mean, I haven't done the numbers, but four or 500 interviews into this thing, the number of successful CEOs, founders, senior pastors who have had that story or a story like that in their childhood is shocking. It's got to be disproportionate. Mm -hmm. What Was there a moment where you were kind of like, okay, this is not going to be my life. I'm curious because I, I didn't grow up in that background. And it just, it just makes me wonder, like, do you have a defining moment where you said, no, this is not for me? Well, you know, I, I think uh, that kind of background, it, usually there's one of two outcomes. You, you either, you know, you either walk in the shoes of your parents and, you know, substance abuse and, you know, broken marriages and those kinds of things, or, or it becomes kind of a motivation to uh, to move in the opposite direction. You know, I used to say that my my dad was a great role model because uh, if I did just the opposite of everything he did and made the opposite choices that he made, you know, I'd probably be in a pretty good place. And don't get me wrong, I, I loved my dad. He was a he, he loved me. Uh, he he just was a, a kind of a broken person that was had a hard time coping with with his life and the cards he was dealt. And you know, so. I actually learned from that, and and that was a motivator to me when I when I went to the Ivy League schools, uh, Cornell. You know, a lot of the other kids there were uh, sons and daughters of the elite. You know, they were right. 
their parents were surgeons and lawyers and CEOs and and I felt like I was there uh, without without a safety net, right? So mm-hmm. I couldn't fail at Cornell because if I did, th- there was no safety net. I mean, in fact, I drove a taxi for two summers in Syracuse, New York, where I grew up. And you know, my fallback probably was if I flunked out of school, I, I might have ended up just driving a taxi the rest of my life. And uh, and, and I, there was another college guy there with me uh, one summer, and uh, he did drop out and, and and became a cab driver the rest of his life. Nothing wrong with being a cab driver, but that's no. not what I wanted for my life. But I, if correct me if this isn't your book because I enjoyed reading it. But did you not say at one point to motivate yourself? Okay, I want to be the guy riding in the taxi rather than the guy driving the taxi. Was that like a motivator yeah. for you? So it, it was a motivator. When I when I drove a taxi, I realized I had never sat in the back seat of a taxi because taxis were for rich people, right? You know, rich right. people yeah. could afford. Nobody could. I couldn't afford a taxi. So I, I used to dream I'd pick businessmen and women up at the airport and drive them to the hotel or whatever, and. And I, and I used to say, well, you know, someday I'm going to be in, in the front seat or in the back seat of the taxi. And, uh, you know, I, I ended up over my career taking a lot of taxis and, and then Ubers after that. So, yeah. So you ended up as president of World Vision. But if, if I understand your background, that wasn't a Christian home that you grew up in, was it? Faith came to you a little bit later or how would you describe it? Yeah, um, my parents were kind of nominally Catholic, Roman Catholic. So, uh, but because of the divorces uh, at that time, they had been excommunicated from the church, and so they didn't feel they were welcome uh, at a Catholic church. And but they did, you know, kind of send my sister and I down the street to uh, go to mass on Sundays when we were little. And um, which now I look back, that's kind of strange. Two small children. Uh, my sister was five or six years older, but you know, going alone to church. You know, yeah, on yeah, yeah. That wouldn't happen uh, these days. Yeah. So, and then when I got to college, I majored in neurobiology and, uh, and I got really into science and, uh, and I kind of became an atheist, you know, maybe an agnostic for, for sure, possibly an atheist, but I, I looked at science as being the answer and, uh, long story I won't necessarily get into, but I I met a young woman, my senior year, uh, who is now my wife of 46 years (laughs) And she was a follower of Christ. And uh, uh, through that relationship, uh, I ended up becoming a Christian. A fairly dramatic experience when I was in business school, uh, prompted by the relationship with her and uh, doing a lot of studying and reading. I think I read 50 books on theology and comparative religion and uh, philosophy. And um, I came to the conclusion, you know, kind of with my scientific method, I kind of came to the conclusion that. Uh, Jesus Christ was who he said he was. And if he was, then that changed everything. And so I basically said, I want to live my life for you and I'll go where you send me. I'll do what you call me to do. Uh, but that's, I'm yours. And that was my conversion moment uh, when I was at the Wharton School. I'm, I may be the only person that's ever become a Christian at the Wharton School of Business. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It's not exactly a fertile ground, is it, for uh, no. for Christianity? How did you how did you believe that was possible? Because you're speaking to a lot of young leaders here. Some of them have a similar background. And I am very curious about, you know, the switch that went on or the self-talk that helped you go, no, I can go to Wharton. I I can do Cornell. I mean, those are Ivy League schools. Like they are, they are top-tier schools to this day. What what kept you going? Because I take it it wasn't, you know, your parents pushed you into that route at all. No. In fact, when I told my mother by that time I was living with my mom and I told her I was going to go to Cornell, she laughed at me. You know, she said, you're going to go to Cornell University. Ha! She said, oh. who's going to pay for that? He said, certainly I can't. And your father's a drunk. He can't pay for it. And I said, well, gee, mom, I, I don't know, but I'll I'll figure it out. And you know, when our kids were getting ready for college, we hovered over them. And you know, right. have you got your essays done? Have you done your application? You know, do you want us to proofread your essays? All of, and you know, I had to do it all on my own. My my mother didn't read my essays, didn't look at my application, didn't. And uh, so I was fortunate. You know, I I got in and I got a scholarship. I had a couple of scholarships, and I don't know what it was. I I just had a drive again, kind of motivated by what I saw in my parents' life that. I don't want my life to turn out that way. And uh, and again, education seemed like the, the way out. 
and I always did pretty well at school. And I thought, well, I can use this and, you know, I can, I can aspire to something greater. And, but, you know, there were moments of doubt. I mean, my first physics exam at Cordell, I enrolled in the engineering school of all things. My first physics exam, I got a 48 and uh, I thought, oh boy, you know, (laughs) this is not going to end well (laughs) because I, I was just not ready to compete at that level. Uh, and uh, I, my high school hadn't prepared me for it. And so that freshman year was terrifying. I mean, I had to study all hours of the day and night and, uh, you know, I made it through, uh, that freshman year and then it, it got a little bit easier as I, you know, got to acclimate it. But yeah. Do you remember, um, again, uh, this, this may be going nowhere, but I just would love to know, were you eight when you kind of realized, okay, I'm going to make a different life for myself, 13, 5, 15, like roughly what stage of your life did that idea occur to you? Yeah. So as I said, when I was 10, the family kind of fell apart with divorce and bankruptcy and foreclosure. And I, I can remember lying in bed about that time as a 10 year old and hearing my parents screaming at each other in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And, uh, at that moment, I realized that my parents could not take care of me, wow. that they could barely take care of themselves. Right. You know, so I, I couldn't depend on them. And and I just felt I'm going to have to do this myself. I'm going to have to be the one that looks after me. And I remember thinking, you know, that year and maybe the year after that, you know, when I'm 18, I will be able to leave or escape from this situation And I started to think about, uh, you know, how would I do that? And because I had an older sister, um, uh, she, you know, when I was 12, she was 18 and going off to college. She went to a teacher's college in New York and, uh, and she kept telling me, Rich, you know, you, you can get into a good college. If you get good grades in high school, you know, there's, there's a way you can get in one. She wanted me to go to Notre Dame Hmm. and you can get into Notre Dame. And uh, she also knew Cornell because it was pretty close to where we grew up, Syracuse. And uh, so she said, but you got to get those grades. And uh, so that's what I, she kind of motivated me and helped me see things that maybe a parent would normally help you see, right? That, Mm -hmm. you know, here's the way, here's the way you can do this. And so, uh, you know, I listened to her and I, you know, I started to buckle down in school and I had some success. And and then I kind of got with a cohort of kids that were all going to college, you know, and, and in my high school. And um, and that became kind of competitive. You know, I think I graduated second in my class, you know, from mm-hmm. high school. Um, and so anyways, then and fortunately, you know, and I say this as a white male, doors were open for me. And growing up in the United States, opportunities were open to me in ways that they weren't open necessarily to women or minorities. And uh, so I I really was the beneficiary of a a culture that was willing to take a risk on a young kid that, you know, worked hard and, you know, got good grades. And I was able to get scholarships and, you know, all of that. So I, I, I was fortunate. Did you have any other mentors along the way? I would, you know, other than, you know, probably some of my high school teachers, you know, uh, took me under their wing and uh, saw the potential in me. So uh, I, although I do say that, you know, no one is more surprised that I've now written four books than my high school English teacher. She would be <laughs> shocked because uh, English was not my, uh, my my subject that I was a bit difficult for her. But um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think teachers uh, inspired me uh, a bit and uh, and helped me see what might be possible, too. Mm. So you moved, you started at Gillette in marketing and then kind of moved through a few companies sitting in the C-suite a couple of times. You had, you had a couple of situations too, where your employment was terminated early in your career that you write about publicly. What, what was that like and why didn't you quit? Can you fill us in on some of those stories? Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been fired twice. Uh, and people are often surprised to hear that because, you know, they look at my resume and they say, wow, you've been really so successful. And, but I was fired twice. So I became the CEO of Parker Brothers Games, uh, Monopoly Clue, Sorry, Nerf Balls, you know. Mm. Uh, I became the CEO when I was 33. And I had six vice, six vice presidents reporting to me who were all in their 50s. And uh, so I took over that company and I was CEO for about two years. And, uh, you know, my wife used to call me business boy because, you know, I was so young and, uh, 
I wasn't ready for the job. I mean, to be very honest, I, I wasn't ready for that kind of responsibility, but I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And, um, but anyways, uh, about two years in, uh, the company was divested. It was owned by General Mills and they divested their toy companies. And when they did that and, and spun them off, they wanted to, Parker Brothers had been through some difficult financial years and they wanted to put new management in and then spin it off on Wall Street. And so they fired virtually all the division presidents uh, at that time and replaced them with new leaders. And so, you know, what goes up must come down. And so I went up like a rocket at Parker Brothers. And then, you know, my 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 descent was even quicker. It was a very sudden, you know, called into the office and today's your last day and very sorry. <laughs> uh, so anyways, that sent me into unemployment, you know, from the corner office to a corner of my basement where I was you know, sitting in my bathrobe, uh, figuring out how do I find another job? You know, it was very, uh, I, yeah, that's I hard. Soul- There's not a ton was, of CEO jobs out there. No, it was, it was kind of soul crushing and, you know, just devastating personally, because we have so much of our identity is wrapped up in what we do. And so, but, you know, it turned out that was a, a time when God really worked in my life in a powerful way. I had plenty of time to read the scripture and pray and, you know, turn to the Lord and, you know, a time of need. And, uh, make a long story short, I, I found another job in about four or five months, uh, moved my family to Pennsylvania and went to work for the Franklin Mint, mm-hmm. which was a, a company that sold collectibles through mail order. And and I actually got a bigger salary than I had at Parker Brothers. So I was back in the game and uh, back at work. Nine months later, I got fired at the Franklin Mint. <laughs> and uh, and here I am unemployed again. And um, it's like, and my my wife said, whatever lesson God is trying to teach you, would you please learn it so that you can <laughs> you can get back to work? Because we had three, you know, she was not working. She was at home and we had three little kids at the time. We have five in total <clears throat> and uh, we had a mortgage and, you know, all the financial worries that you have when those things are uh, real. And so that time I was unemployed for nine months, you know, nine months of kind of agonizing every day. Lord, why is this happening? What What is it you want to teach me? And the aha moment I had really came out of my my old catechism classes at, uh, as a young child, uh, uh, getting ready for my first communion. And one of the questions was, why did God make me? And I started to ponder this question and I remembered the answer. He, he made me to know him, to love him and to serve him in this world. Hmm. And then I realized, look, that's the purpose of my life. The purpose of my life is not to sell toys and games or collectibles or fine China. The purpose of my life is to know God, to love God and to serve him in this world. That's what That's the deal I made with God when I became a Christian, that I was going to follow him and serve him. And so uh, when I finally got a job, I got a job at Lenox as a a president of their smallest division that had been losing money for three years. And um, I was kind of the last hope for that division. And I went that first day of work and I just prayed, Lord, I am not here to sell more China. Uh, I am not here to succeed. I am here to know you, love you, and serve you in this place. Help me do this today. And I think I prayed that prayer every day. I was at Lenox 11 years, became group president, COO, and then CEO of the company uh, over those 11 years. And the Lord gave me another season of you know prosperity before I was called to World Vision. How did you, because there's a lot of leaders who are still reeling from 2020 and early 2021 and have have encountered a lot of hardship and they're trying Mm -hmm. to overcome it. What was your self-talk like when you got fired twice in a row? How did you, how did you not just give up at that point? Yeah, it was really, it was really discouraging and depression, uh, depressing. I, I think I came as close to depression as I ever have in my life during that period because, you know, self-esteem, you know, all of the things that uh, identity, self-esteem, who am I, you know, what, and, and then just the the weight of the responsibility that, you know, I've got children, I've got a family, I've got a mortgage, I've got, I've, I've got to find a way to, you know, uh, get back into a, a work situation. But it was, you know, again, I, I just leaned on the Lord. Lord, n- not my will, but Thy will. And mm. you know, I'll, I, I want to follow You. And what do You have for me? And uh, I'm open to, you know, whatever it might be. And and just taking it one day at a time and being diligent. You know, I I I spent 
roughly seven or eight hours a day looking for jobs. You know, mm. at the time we didn't have the internet. Uh, so <laughs> I was looking at the Wall Street Journal want ads. I was writing, uh, you know, cold letters, uh, applying for jobs. I was networking uh, through former business associates and, you know, finding leads. And I'd occasionally get an interview. And uh, so anyways, it was just that process until finally, um, you know, Lennox uh, came along. I went to the interviews and that's a that's a funny story because I heard there was a job at Lennox for the CEO of the small division, and I thought I was a perfect fit. And so I got the name of the human resources vice president, and I called him. and uh, And I got his assistant who said, "Well, you know, Mr. P is you know busy right now, and you know, please give me a message, and I'll give it to him." And I said, "Well." I know this sounds crazy, but I think I could be president of that division <laughs> that you have. And I'm calling to see if he would interview me. And she probably thought I was like a nut job. You know, this guy's calling, thinks he can be president of, of our division. I ended up calling her more than 20 times over a period of two months and le leaving a message every time, you know, the persistence, right? And and I we were on first day. I said, Nancy, this is Rich. And you know why I'm calling. I need to talk to Mr. P. And uh and she said, I know, Rich, you know, I, I keep nagging at him that he needs to call you. And I'm really mad at him because he hasn't returned your call. I'm going to try again. And so finally he called me back, you know, and uh, and I gave him my spiel. And he he said, well, you know, we have a search firm and, you know, we're doing a nationwide search. Why don't you send me your resume and remind me of our phone call? Because I'm going to forget you as soon as I hang up. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I literally I, I said, OK, and uh, so hung up typed out a letter, reminded him of the phone call, attached the resume, sent it in, thought I'd never hear from him again. And the next week he called and he said, you know, Rich, he said, I got your resume. He said, my, you have an impressive background. He, he, you're like a perfect match for this job. And I said, well, <laughs> I, I, I know his name was Wayne. I said, I know Wayne. I, that's what I've been trying to tell you. I think I am a good fit for that job. And uh, anyway, it turns out he was a believer. I found that out later. Uh, ah. He was a believer. And uh and then years later, he came to work at World Vision. So it's funny how God oh, works. Oh, that's things. amazing. But, so anyways, I got the job, uh, went through a bunch of interviews, got the job. And he ended up reporting to me uh, at the end of the thing, because when I became CEO, you know, he was still ahead of HR and he reported to me. And I said, I should fire you for the way you treated me. <laughs> but, um, but we became good friends. You know, thank you for sharing that story. I think you probably encouraged a lot of people listening today. I'd love to ask you, because you've basically sat in the C-suite for most of the last three or four decades. What, um, <clears throat> when you see that kind of persistence, because there is a fine line, Rich, between being persistent and being annoying. And mm -hmm. it's another thing, again, hundreds of interviews into this, where you're not the only person to say that. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we had Ryan Hawk from uh, you know, he tells the story of trying to cold call people and sell Lexus Nexus and mm. having to sometimes make 80 phone calls to try to close a sale. Kathy Heller talked about that when she was on the podcast. So this is this is a recurring theme. When you see that sitting in the CEO seat, which you've sat in for, for years, when you see that in a younger leader who's trying to get a foot in the door, what is the line in your mind between I'm going to reward that or you know, I need a restraining order. How, how do I get rid of this people? Is there, is there a line in your mind? Cause it's, it's really fascinating. I think most of us are too timid to do what you did. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think there probably is a line, but you know, um, I, uh, I think persistence is often rewarded. Um, mm. you know, Jesus talked about the persistent widow who kept, yeah. you know, asking, you know, no, I agree God with you. For, for something. And, uh, persistence is an important quality in, in a leader um, because you're going to face hard times as a leader. You're going to be in difficult circumstances and how you persevere and persist in the face of opposition and difficulty is is really a, a critical leadership quality. So I, I, I would say in my career, I've run into young people that have applied for jobs, you know, to work for me or my organization. And usually that persistence at least got them a hearing. Um, mm -hmm. I interviewed a young woman a few years ago who uh, she ended up at the Tim Tebow Foundation, but she she was a dancer. You know, she'd been a dancer in college and I think ballet and things like that. And uh, she kept trying to get her foot in the door at the Tim Tebow Foundation and and couldn't and and just tried everything. So finally, she uh, she bought uh, 
a pair of ballet slippers and and put them in a box with a note uh, about her her dance and and her resume and she said I tried and tried and tried to get a foot in the door and maybe this is the only way to do it and so the foot in the door were the two ballet slippers that she she got in <laughs> The door, and they called her after that, and they thought that was so unique that they called her, and they actually hired her. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I think persistence. Uh, you know, you've got to at some point you've got to know when, maybe when to move on. And no, when I get- hear that. We've been through a couple of rounds of hiring in my little company, and uh, there's one guy I won't name names who has applied several times. It just wasn't the right fit, but a really good person. My my team keeps cheering him on saying, Hey, maybe at some point we're going to find a role for this guy. And then he emailed back rather than, you know, after being rejected a couple of times, it would be easy Mm -hmm. to say, ah, forget it. But he emailed back and said, listen, if there's some project I can help with, if there's some side work I can do, count me in. I, I would love to be a part of this someday. And I don't know, but when I saw that, I'm like, yeah, we really have to take this guy seriously. You know, you know, it was respectful. It was yeah. kind. It was helpful. I'm like, hats off to him. You know, there was a guy that worked for me at World Vision. I say he worked for me, but when he first approached World Vision, he had this idea that uh, he could raise money for World Vision by starting a running ministry, marathons and things like that, half marathons, marathons. And that's a that's a, a way a lot of nonprofits raise money. They get, you know, a, a hundred runners in the Chicago Marathon and they all raise money and and we didn't have any budget for him. And and so uh, our guy in Chicago, who was a leader there, uh, he was the one that was the contact. And he finally, the guy was so persistent. Look, I'll, I'll do this as a volunteer. I'll, you know, I'll, I just want to do, I just believe in this so much. And so finally our guy in Chicago said, look, if you'll work for half a salary, you know, I'll, I'll bring you on half time to try this. And, uh, so he agreed. He said, I'll come on for half a salary. You know, I, I don't think he even had benefits. He said, I'll come on. And he started this uh, running ministry at World Vision. It's now called Team World Vision. And now he's the vice president of church partnerships. Uh, <laughs> this guy that, you know, knocked on the door and said, I'll do anything to work for you because I have this vision. And Team World Vision is raising, I think, more than $10 million a year for World Vision. We're the largest single charity in the Chicago Marathon with something like 1,500 runners. Um, and it's all because this guy just believed he could do it and, uh, and, and convinced us he could do it. And then he, we saw how good he was and he got promoted and, you know, became vice president. So that's amazing. Uh, that, you know, yeah. but there it is persistence and resilience, right? I see mm-hmm. that as a thread in your story and you tell some of these stories in your book. Some of this stuff is, is new to me. So this is, this is fascinating. Now in your new book, you talk about the problem with success as a metric or goal. Mm-hmm. Why is that a problem? if you make success your objective? Yeah, well, um, you know, I talk in the book about a, a success culture, right? You know, yeah, that yeah. we we live, we're, we're kind of marinating in a success-oriented uh, culture in our world. And, you know, we celebrate the wealthiest people, the winningest teams, the fastest growing companies, the biggest churches, the most famous celebrities. We are literally marinating in a success-obsessed culture, I would say in North America, Canada, the United States, uh, the American dream is all about success, right? And, mm-hmm. and so we probably, I, I say in the book, it's a little bit like carbon monoxide, a colorless, odorless gas that we're, bre- we're breathing it every day, but it can be deadly. I mean, if, if, if we make success our idol, if, if we'll do anything to be successful, um, that's dangerous. And, mm. and for, for a Christian, it's dangerous for anybody, but for a Christian to, to make success an idol in your life is, uh, you know, is problematic. And, you know, I tell the story in the book. In fact, the inspiration for my book, Lead Like It Matters to God, was something Mother Teresa said years ago, that she was being visited by a, a senator from Oregon in the United States, Senator Mark Hatfield, a well-known kind of social mm-hmm. justice advocate. And and he went over and visited Mother Teresa in Calcutta. And being a you know an analytical guy, he he looked at the the sheer ocean of poverty and suffering in Calcutta. And then he looked at this tiny little nun in her little you know ministry in the middle of this the slums. And he realized you know this woman's never going to succeed in 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 eradicating poverty even in Calcutta, let alone the rest of the world. And so he said to her mother, you know, don't you feel like a failure because you will never be able to 
to help all the poor. You just will never have enough resources to do it. And and you've been doing this for 30 or 40 years. You know, don't you feel uh, kind of hopeless about mm. this? And she and she gave him a 14 word answer that I believe reversed the entire leadership paradigm or success paradigm we have in, in our culture. And she said, my dear senator, God did not call me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. And for a Christian leader, I want them to hear those words. You are not called by God to be successful. You are called to be faithful to the, the values, uh, to, to be a person of character, to be a good ambassador for Christ. And so a person of character, not a person of success. You may be successful, but success should not be your goal. Faithfulness should be your goal. And if you are successful, great. That's a, that's a you know collateral benefit uh, of being faithful to the Lord. But but I, I want to differentiate because you asked about is success a, a good metric or a bad metric? And I want to differentiate between the success of a business or ministry and the success of an individual. So okay, what I just yeah. talked about, I just talked about individual success, that we as individuals should not make success an idol in our lives. Mm. Uh, businesses, ministries, organizations, they have to be successful. I mean, if they're not successful, they won't survive. You know, yeah, you yeah. have to be able to balance the budget and, you know, show a profit or, you know, uh, you know, pay, pay the bills. Um, but for people, you know, success can have a lot of definitions for people. It could be money. Money is my definition of success. It could be position, mm -hmm. professional fulfillment. It could be just happiness. So, you know, I, I'm successful if I'm happy. I'm a cab driver. I love driving a cab. I'm happy. I'm successful. I've got a family who loves me. I'm successful. Uh, it's just that, we have to be careful as individuals not to make uh, success the goal and the idol because before long, the, the, the ends justify the means, right? And you start doing things to achieve that success that uh, cause you to have some regret later. Now, I appreciate what you're saying, and I'm certainly not going to take on Mother Teresa, but I want to give you some a line that I hear all the time, especially in the church, not so much in business, because if you're not successful in business, you're done but from church leaders, and they'll often say, you know, we're not growing, but we're faithful. Or mm -hmm. I'm not successful, but I'm faithful. And I almost feel like sometimes, Rich, and I just love for your comment on this, you know, that Christians can use the rubric of faithfulness to mm -hmm. blanket incompetence or laziness. Can you speak to that for a moment? Yeah. Um, you know, when I came to World Vision, in 1998, you know, I found a group of people who were passionate about the mission of the organization. I mean, I'd never seen such passion about a mission. You know, when, when you're selling fine china and crystal, it's a little harder to get really passionate when you wake up in the morning <laughs> that I'm going to sell more dishes today, you know. But World Vision, you're, you're literally helping the poor, you're feeding the hungry, you're bringing clean water to villages, you know, you're giving micro loans to poor people to help them out of poverty. And you can get really passionate about it, but I didn't find a culture of excellence uh, in the in the in the financial realm at World Vision, the fundraising and the managing the budgets. I, I found a culture of excellence in the field, you know, in terms of the the actual hands-on work uh, out there. And I, I I coined a phrase. I said, you know, at World Vision, you seem to be good people doing good things, and you think that's good enough. And I said, that's not good enough. You know, you need to be good people. You are good people. You're doing good things, but you need to do them with excellence. You need to do them with excellence. And when I was at Lenox, I had a little sign on my desk that uh, it said, relax. It's only dishes. You know? <laughs> and, and, and because even at Lenox, you know, we would have these panic attacks about missing our quarterly earnings or not making our goal and not getting our bonus this year. And 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 to put it in perspective, I had this little sign to say, you know what? Nobody's going to die here. I mean, if we have a bad quarter, uh, it's only dishes. Uh, you know, so let's put it in perspective. Let's work hard. Let's do our best. But let's put it in perspective. Nobody has a fine China emergency in their life. But I said to the folks at World Vision, I said, how would you feel if I had a sign on my desk here that said, relax, it's only children. It's only lives. <laughs> well, obviously, you know. And, and I said, I want an organization that works with a sense of excellence and urgency uh, because literally children's lives are at stake. And as Christians, excellence is our witness, right? I, I want World Vision to be on the cover of Business Week or Forbes someday as the best run organization in America. Never happened. But, 
Um, and I said, you know, when you're serving the Lord, you know, you need to serve with excellence. You know, we we need to be those people uh, who the world looks at and say, wow, you, you got to admire those Christians at World Vision because they really they really work hard and they deliver and they make good on their promises. So I, I think, you know, you can't use that as an excuse that because uh, being faithful is also about being excellent, you know. Jesus never said, I want you to be faithful and give half-hearted efforts to your work. You know, uh, there's a verse in scripture, I can't, I'll paraphrase it. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord and not men, it is the Lord Christ you serve, you know? Mm. So I, I don't have the reference for that, but that's No, but I know what you mean. Yeah. I, I can imagine a whole lot of church leaders putting a little sign on their desk that says, relax, it's just eternity. Or, right. <laughs> you know, right. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're right. These are really big. It's only life change, right? No, these mm-hmm. are really big things. So when you're pursuing a culture of excellence, then um, you're right. One of the challenges of not-for-profit work, a lot of knowledge work, meaningful work, startup world, is you can get obsessed with it. And mm-hmm. like, when is your ministry ever done? right? There were always more kids. There were always more families, always more poverty, always more disease. Um, How do you begin? Because this is another issue on the other side that a lot of leaders struggle with. Some are like, yeah, whatever. You know, I phoned it in. I got the message done. I'm done, right? They're they're using Mm -hmm. faithfulness as an excuse to be mediocre or poor. But let's flip Mm -hmm. the switch. There are other people who are so obsessed with the mission. And like, that's what I tell my team all the time. Like sometimes the work is just never done. Like when, Hmm. when is it good enough? So how do you draw boundaries in a, in a situation like that where you really are trying to change the world? You know, there's a whole chapter in my book on balance because I think it's so important for a leader to have a balanced life. Uh, You know, if your life is your work and your work is your life, you live in a very small world, you know? (laughs) So that's, that's what I say. But you know, the founder of World Vision was a guy named Bob Pierce, and uh, he he was born or he he started World Vision in 1950, just after the World War. And uh, this man was like on fire uh, for the gospel and on fire to help the poor. Um, I he passed away in 1978, but I I once met one of his original board members, <clears throat> and this board member described him as a psychotic for God. He was a psychotic for God. Well, sadly, Bob Pierce's story didn't end well. I mean, he did start World Vision and it became the largest Christian relief and development organization in the world, maybe the largest relief and development organization in the world of any kind. Um, But in 1967, the board of directors fired him. His, His passion was so red hot that, you know, he was impulsive, uh, he was disruptive to the organization, and he was ultimately destroying the organization he built. And the board recognized that, you know, he, he was headed for a breakdown. And uh, one of his daughters committed suicide. Oh. He lost his marriage. Um, he became estranged from the rest of his family. And uh, there was one story where his, his daughter committed suicide. He flew home from Asia to attend the funeral and then from the funeral, he, he was driven directly back to the airport to return to Asia, leaving his grieving wife and his other two daughters uh, to grieve alone. And that's how driven he was. And, and so he ended up losing his family, losing his job, losing his ministry. And how did that benefit anything? And, you know, I talk in the book, of, you know, that for a workaholic, mm. uh, Christian ministry is like a a bar, a fully stocked bar to an alcoholic, because you you can say, hey, I'm doing it for the Lord. I, I'm doing it for the Lord. I know I work 80 hours a week, but, you know, honey, I'm doing it for the Lord. And I really don't think the Lord calls us to abandon all the other relationships in our life and all the other responsibilities we have in our life uh, in order to serve him. And when we do that, we talked about idolatry, but isn't it a form of idolatry when a pastor or a ministry leader says, without me there, God will not accomplish his purposes. If I'm not at that committee meeting, if I'm not preaching every single Sunday, uh, if, if I'm not involved in every detail of the new sanctuary we're building, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not there, God cannot accomplish his purposes without me. And it also sends, so that's idolatry, and it also sends a horrible message to your team that 
you know, your team of people who are there to help, right, to pitch in and to help, you're saying, I don't trust you to do this work. I have to be there. I have to oversee it. I have to make every decision. And so I just think uh, Christian leaders have to be really careful about this because, you know, I like to say I, in the last chapter of my book, I said, you have to understand something that what God is doing through you, it involves you, but it doesn't depend on you. Mm. And I give examples. Peter was involved in leading the first century church, but the outcome did not depend on Peter. David was involved in slaying Goliath, but it didn't depend on David. You know, Paul was involved in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles, but the outcome didn't depend on Paul because God works through us, but and he will use us, um, but he will prevail and he will get his work done. Uh, and, and so that should be a relief to a Christian leader that I'm involved. God wants me to work with excellence and to use the gifts he's given me. But the outcome doesn't depend on me, and I can trust God for the outcome. So uh, let's let's go a little bit further with that. I mean, you are trying to address slash solve global poverty, right? That's a mm -hmm. pretty big mission, I would say. It's not like, yeah. oh, better city, better you know neighborhood. It's like, no, the world, poverty, and we, we want to make a, a dent. And I talk to leaders pretty much every day who are like, they don't know when to stop. There's no stop line because ministry never ends. Or if you're running a startup in the corporate world, right? That's a very intense yeah. season and you believe in it. If you're a founder, you believe in it. Like you really do. How did you turn off for a Saturday? How did you sleep at night knowing that, that or how did you even draw? Because you're dealing with limited resources, right? Like you probably can't be in every single nation. You can't spend the amount of money you would love to spend in a country that you're in. So how did how did you get peace around the boundaries that you had to inevitably set mm -hmm. in your ministry? Yeah, so part of it comes to this issue of trusting God. You know, that mm -hmm. I felt God called me to World Vision. Um, I felt God gave me certain gifts that I could use at World Vision. And, you know, th there's a phrase I like to use that all we can do really is the best we can do. So, mm -hmm. You know, if if we make best efforts, and best efforts don't mean most hours, it, it just means using our giftedness as best we can uh, to serve the Lord, to motivate our teams, to hire and fire the right people for the ministry, to set the right direction for the ministry. We really must trust trust God for the outcome. And the the other thing that I learned is you've heard the expression: "Is the glass half full or half empty?" So. When you work in a humanitarian space and people are dying every day and there's more refugees and more conflict and more famines, and it's very easy to live in the half full, uh, the half empty side of the glass, right? Uh, you know, I've got to save one more. I've got to save one more. I, I you know, I, you know, I, in other words, you, you grieve over the people that you, you aren't able to help because you can't help everybody. And I found that I had to live in the glass half full side of that equation to celebrate the ones we could help, mm. to celebrate the victories, to live in the celebration culture of look at how many people we've been able to help and what could we do to help more? You know, what could we do to, you know, what, what are our best ideas? Um, but just to, to trust, you know, I, I used to say to our staff, you know, God loves these children more than we ever will love them. And we can we can take that to the bank. We can, we can know that. Uh, but God is also using us to, uh, to respond to them. And, and so what can we do next and what can be our, our next effort? So it's, it's kind of a, and again, you slip into that idolatry that unless I do this 80 hours a week, seven days a week, uh, you know, it, it, it won't happen. That's, in a way, that's not not trusting God, you know. Mm. Yeah, I think of the disciples, you know, when Jesus was going to feed the 5,000, they were telling, you, you, you can't do it. It would take eight months wages. You know, there's no way. We've got to send the crowd home. And everything. Jesus is like, chill, you know, chill. I got this. You know, just just follow me and follow my orders, you know, and, and watch and learn, you know, watch and learn. And, you know, when I came to World Vision, in the first five or six years I was there, revenues tripled. The revenues tripled. And I don't think it was because I was a genius. Yeah. I think it was because God was saying, thank you, good and faithful servant, for being willing to serve and making your gifts available. Now sit back and watch. Because my first day at World Vision, I was cowering in my office saying, Lord, 
I hope this wasn't a huge mistake. I hope you know what you're doing because I have no idea what to do next. I am helpless and I was whimpering and, uh, and it was like God said to me, that's exactly where I want you, Rich, helpless and whimpering and totally dependent on me. Just be faithful and watch because I got this. Hmm. How did you develop the skills for what was ahead for you at World Vision? How did you figure out along the way? Sure, you have an MBA from Wharton, very impressive. But as you know, that doesn't fill in all the gaps. How did, how did you begin to figure that approach out? Well, you know, one of the first realizations I had at World Vision, because, you know, I, I just had a conversation this morning with another group about when you come from a corporate environment to a ministry or church environment uh, for employment, uh, the cultures are so radically different mm-hmm. that you, you can't just come in and lead in exactly the same way you did in the for-profit world, because the culture is very, very different. And Sometimes people entering a ministry culture, I, I, I use the metaphor of, remember when the old spacecrafts would hit the atmosphere, they're, they're returning to Earth, and there's tremendous turbulence and heat, and there's heat shields, and everybody holds their breath because they, they, they lose radio contact, and for eight minutes, you don't know if the spacecraft is, has burned off, burned up entering the atmosphere, or whether it's going to parachute safely into the ocean. I remember. And, yeah. um uh, and I think when you enter a Christian ministry from a corporate world and probably vice versa, th- that culture shock is is real. And you have to adapt as a leader to a different kind of culture. So when I got to World Vision, uh, there was that turbulence as I was trying to adapt my leadership style to. And the organization simultaneously was, was trying to adapt to me and a new leadership and a new point of view and a new vision. And so we kind of met each other in the middle, but I realized that I, I didn't have skill sets in some of these areas. So public speaking was very important. Hmm. You know, uh, I was not a preacher. I was not a public speaker. I, I was, you know, I was a CEO. I used to do PowerPoint presentations to my board, but I, you know, I, that was the extent of my public speaking. And then I also realized that the staff wanted a shepherd. They wanted a pastoral person who could interpret the ministry theologically and inspire them out of scripture. And again, uh, you know, I had no seminary degree, no theological background. So I had to grow into those spaces. And, but again, you know, I found over time that the Lord gave me or helped me identify skills that I never even knew I had. I mean, I never thought I'd write a book. I said earlier, and, and yet I've written four now. And, um, it was like, all right, Lord, maybe I can do this. I can try, you know, and and again, you know, step out on faith and see if the Lord will will help you to do these things. But but there was a lot of adaptation I had to do. Were there things or what were the things that you tried to bring in from the corporate world that just didn't work in a nonprofit context? Corporate tactics that you're like, yep, got to abandon that. Were there any that like that? Well, you know, corporate leadership, it, it certainly isn't always like this, but it's its, it's pretty hierarchical. It, it can be very hi- hierarchical and very authoritative. You know, it's the old thing, like, here's the organization chart. I'm here. You're here. Any questions? You know, <laughs> in other words, uh, the, the corporate leader is and can be an authoritarian dictator, right? You know, that because you're higher up in the organization chart, you get to make all the decisions. The people don't like the decisions. It's or tough you're the on them. founder. In You're the founder, cases. yeah, founderitis mm-hmm. is another issue that you know we deal with in the nonprofit world or even in the for-profit world. The founder has all the answers, and so the best corporate leaders don't lead like that, in my opinion. They they're they're much more participative and collaborative. And but I found at World Vision that I had to be even more collaborative because my legitimacy as a leader did not come from where I sat on the organization chart. My legitimacy came from how I embraced the ministry and understood it and could communicate the ethos of that ministry to all of our constituencies and um, and the first one being our staff. And so in the staff's mind, this guy who had been selling fine China 30 days ago was an interloper who frankly had no business leading World Vision. And, and I had to prove something before they could even accept me as their <laughs> leader. I had to prove that I, I saw them, I heard them, I, I wanted to learn from them, and I was going to let them be my guide uh, initially uh, until I got to a place where I felt I could 
start to make these decisions, you know, uh, myself. And so that's where humility, I've got a whole chapter in my book on humility that I came in with a humble spirit to say, guys, I know I seem like an illegitimate leader. All I can tell you is that I feel like God called me here. I'm being obedient and I need you, each and every one of you to help me find my way through this together. You know, uh, you're critically important, uh, my team and, uh, teach me, you know, uh, help me learn. Um, I didn't come in like a know-it-all that said, all right, starting Monday, here's what we're going to do, you know, <laughs> and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And it, it was much more of a, a learning curve for both of us. What would you say, and I want to flip this question both ways, what would you say the business world could learn from the church world? And then I want to ask you what the church could learn from business. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think, um, the business world, you know, interesting, when I left Lennox, you know, some of my colleagues there kind of chuckled and said, yeah, I guess Rich is retiring early. You know, he wants to leave the pressure of the corporate world and, and retire to a nonprofit, right? You know, that was kind of their attitude. And after being at World Vision for a year, you know, I said to some of my former colleagues, I said, what I am asked to do here is at least three times as complex is what I was asked to do at Lennox. I said, first of all, we're trying to solve the oldest problems facing the human race, poverty, genocide, famine, wow. pandemic diseases, um, you know, human trafficking. Uh, we're trying to solve the toughest problems facing the human race, doing it, living off donations. And I thought of that old saw about Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, the famous dance pair from the 1940s and 50s, where Ginger Rogers said, you know, Fred Astaire got all the credit, but I had to do everything he did backwards and in high heels. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, at World Vision, I felt as a nonprofit, we had to do everything that a for-profit had to do, but we had to do it backwards and in high heels, living off donations uh, every time we got a donation, the donor wanted to know how much our, our overhead was. Are you spending too much on overhead? Nobody ever asked what my overhead was at Lennox, who bought my products. Or yeah, yeah, if you yeah. buy a if you buy a buy a Toyota, you don't care what the overhead of the company is. You just care whether the product is good. And you know, but so, anyways, I, I think that uh, th there's something in in the not for profit world which I'll call soft power versus the hard power of the corporate world. Hard power, in fact, Jim Collins said this in one of his writings, uh, in Good to Great, that, you know, hard power is is not that challenging because if a leader's got a gun to your head, you know, the, the organization chart, you know, I can fire you if you don't obey me. That's not leadership, he said. Hmm. But a nonprofit leader has to lead through influence and persuasion. You've got to influence and persuade donors. You've got to influence and persuade pastors and church partners. You've got to influence the U.S. government on policy issues. Uh, and even with your staff, uh, you can try an authoritarian approach to your staff, but in my experience, it doesn't work very well in a ministry context or a not-for-profit world because they feel, your staff feel like they wanna be full partners in the cause, right? They, they've all given up salaries that could be much higher to work for the cause. The cause is important to them and they don't wanna be treated, they wanna be treated like full partners, not like employees. And so uh, nonprofit leadership, I think, offers uh, some challenges that a lot of for-profit leaders would probably fail at, would probably fail at. Well, it would be interesting to talk to, like, for example, Adam Grant, who's written a lot in that area. And I didn't ask him about that when he was on the show. But um, that seems to be where younger generations are moving. They want to be seen as collaborators, even in the for-profit space. They want to work for a just cause needs to be about more than the bottom line. How would you flip it? What do you think, because you're involved in the church and nonprofit world, what do you think the church and nonprofit world could learn from the for-profit world? Well, first of all, there are just a lot of skill sets, principles, techniques that transfer very well from one organization to another. Um, good management, you know, financial accountability, risk management, HR practices, performance management, strategic planning. You know, I said earlier that businesses and, and big corporations are learning laboratories for uh, these things. And um, uh, so they have a lot to teach, you know, a lot of uh, best practices that have 
have met the test of competitiveness, you know, and uh, as businesses have to compete for customers and for market share. Uh, so some of those things are, are great. You know, you, you bring them over with you uh, to a nonprofit um, environment and they, they will they will work there as well. I mean, they might have to be modified in some way. But um, <clears throat> but, you know, I talked earlier about excellence, you know, and, and I think we 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 need to aspire to excellence in the not for profit world. And, you know, there is this um, uh, sometimes in ministry and you mentioned it earlier, Carrie, uh, this this notion of uh, excellence is a worldly value um, performance is a worldly value and we're in a spiritual space. But again, I think, and it's hard when you pray with somebody in the morning, it's hard to give them a brutal performance review in the afternoon or maybe fire them on the next Friday. Um, and so I think sometimes in a, a church environment, um, problems go unaddressed for a long period of time because mm-hmm. In the culture, it's hard to address those problems. In fact, I was just on the phone this morning with a pastor who uh, I'm on his advisory council, and he's got very much the same thing. He's got a group of people uh, and a leader that uh, is not working with excellence. And and what do I do? You know, and how long can I let this go on? And, you know, I I don't want to fire her. And, uh, you know, and we had a conversation about, well, you know, if there's a if there's a hole in the boat and you don't plug it, the whole boat sinks, you know, the whole <laughs> boat sinks, you know, or if there's a bad apple in the barrel and you don't remove it, the whole barrel spoils. So you the leader has to do something and there has to be some some excellence uh, as well. And so, you know, I think churches and ministries have to be willing to make tough decisions Um uh, for the health of the organization and, and even for the health of those individuals. Cause I, I believe in most cases when someone's failing at their job, they know it, uh, they mm-hmm. probably know it before you know it and they're, they're drowning and, and they need somebody to, to get them out of their misery. And I used to say, there's no such thing as bad people. There's only good people in the wrong job. And that same person who might be failing in the job they have might be very successful in another culture, another organization, in a different job that's more suited to their gifts. And so sometimes when you terminate somebody or move them from one position to another, you're doing them a big favor and and you're actually helping them come to terms with their own giftedness. Well, the time has flown by, but I'd love to double click on that for a second, because that is you've 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 honed in on something that I've found in my experience, not only difficult for me, I've done it before, don't enjoy it, but almost impossible in some faith sectors, which is terminating someone. You're right. Mm-hmm. Some people are like, I just can't do it. I don't think it's Christian. What are some best practices you've seen in terms of, you know, allowing someone to leave with their dignity and and to do it well? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, it should never be a surprise to someone that they're getting terminated. Um uh, I, I think the healthiest thing is an ongoing dialogue around performance between a leader and a subordinate. Um, you clear expectations, frequent conversations about how are we doing toward those goals and towards those expectations, give and take back and forth. Um, you know, I used to do 360 reviews on all the people that worked for me so that it would not just be my opinion of their performance, but their peers could weigh in and say, here's what we think about their performance, or the people underneath them could say, here's what we think about their performance. So get a clear view of an individual. And so over time, you know, hopefully that individual, if you're if they're failing in the job, it's it's not a surprise that's sprung on them, you know, very suddenly, but it's something that there's been multiple discussions. There's been multiple opportunities to turn things around. Maybe there are some resources brought in to help an executive coach or a, a mentor or, uh, you know, some things like that. But when all of that fails, um, then I think it's time for the conversation that it's probably best. You know, you're not succeeding in this position. You're not able to meet the expectations I have for you here. And, uh, uh, it's time for you to move on. And if there's not another position that is more suitable for that individual, and there usually isn't, um, you have to make the hard decision of, of termination. And, you know, uh, that's hard. That's a hard day for, you know, it's happened to me twice. It was 
two of the hardest days of my life. Um, but I, you know, in fact, a person I terminated at Lennox was a vice president and he'd been there for many years and everybody loved him. That was even harder. He wasn't a bad person. He was you know, really well liked, but he was failing in the job. And I told him that day, I said, I know this is not the day for you to hear this, but I said, you're a very talented and gifted person, mm-hmm. but you're, you're failing in this environment and your, your, your skill sets are not the right ones for this place at this time. But if you find there's another job out there where you could thrive, you know, uh, another culture, another job, another organization where I'm sure you could thrive. And, and, you know, if I see you in a year, I said, I wouldn't be surprised if, if you look back on this day and said, Rich, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I did find another job. I am loving it. I am thriving. And lo and behold, a year later, uh, I was at the tabletop show in New York and I went into a competitor's showroom, Waterford Crystal, and there he was across the room. He had been hired by Waterford and our eyes met and he walked over to me and I thought, uh-oh. Uh, and I said, hey, uh, how are you doing? And uh, he said, you know, Rich, I, I love this company. I love my job. I, I've got a new lease on life. He said, a year ago, you told me that this could be a good thing in my life. And he said, I, was, I wasn't ready to hear it at all. But he said, you were right. He said, I... I just needed to be like a like a, a withering plant. I needed to be repotted into some fresh soil. And I've been blooming here and I love it. And he said, by the way, we're going to kick your butt in the marketplace this year. <laughs> and, you know, and I said, well, touche, you know, I hope I, I hope you try, you know, and I, I don't hope you succeed, but I hope you try. And uh, so that really it helped me as a leader to say, well, that, that was a good thing because he was drowning and, you know, somebody needed to throw him a life raft and it was hard to do. I never enjoyed firing anybody, even people that were terrible uh, employees. I, I never enjoyed because, you know, they have families and they have uh, responsibilities. So, well, I had a feeling this was going to be a delightful conversation when I was working through your book and it's turned out to be just that. Any final thoughts you want to leave with leaders today, Rich? Well, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is I wanted to talk to leaders in the secular marketplace because there are so many leaders, uh, most Christian leaders are not in Christian ministry per se. You know, they're they're working at Amazon or Microsoft or General Motors or, you know, they're working at a university, they're working in a hospital system. And, and so I, I think one of the issues that uh, pastors probably deal with as well in their congregation is people that compartmentalize their faith and they they basically understand themselves to be Christians, but in their workplace, they don't see that as a place to take their faith. And we, of course, we live in an, an increasingly secularized society where faith is not welcome in the workplace and faith conversations are not welcome. And so I'm not talking about proselytizing people in the workplace, but uh, you know, I, I say this in the book, you know, that on Sunday, some of these leaders, they they hear about putting on the full armor of God from Ephesians. But on Monday morning, if they don't put on the full armor of the world to go into that difficult workplace, they're going to get eaten alive. You know, it's a dog eat dog world. And pastor, you don't understand what I'm facing in, in the place that I work. But I want to encourage those leaders that, you know, God has placed you in that workplace to be his ambassador. Second Corinthians 520. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God is making his appeal through us. And so if you work at one of those places, you're the person that God wants to make his appeal through. You're an ambassador for Christ in that workplace. And how do you be an ambassador? Again, not by proselytizing. An ambassador tries to embody the character, the values, and the priorities of the one who sent them. And so as a Christian in the workplace, if you go into that Maybe it's a toxic workplace. Maybe it's a difficult workplace. But if you go into that place as a leader of integrity, if you go in there as a leader of humility, if you're a forgiving person that you know forgives others when they make a mistake and asks for forgiveness when you make a mistake, if you go in there with a loving spirit, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, those neighbors are your coworkers. Hmm. Do you love them uh, in, in the sense that you want the best for them? Can you be the leader that says it's not about me succeeding? It's about helping every one of you succeed, because if every one of you succeeds, I'll probably succeed as well. So I'm here as your coach, your mentor to help you accomplish the goals uh, and to realize your God given potential 
if you can be that kind of leader in, in a difficult workplace, you are an island in the storm for the people. And your character is your witness. So my, my advice is take God to work with you. Take your faith to work with you. And you may be the odd man out. You may be unusual in that workplace. But I've known very few places that didn't appreciate a leader with, those, with that kind of character. Um, you will be an oasis for the people who work under you because you'll create an environment where they can flourish, even in a difficult organization. Rich, tell us where people can find you and the book online. Well, the book is available pretty much online everywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, ChristianBooks.com. You can find me on Twitter at Rich Stearns, and uh, you can find World Vision at worldvision.org. Or World Vision Canada, I think, is Mm worldvision.org.ca. And, uh, yeah. Rich, thank you so much. It's been a joy. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.